Hey there, I'm Ken the Metal Professor. This video is my penance for making a mess of a comment thread on a Reddit post in one of the math subreddits. Uh, sometimes I will make follow-up videos for questions that are particularly fun, have good answers, that can be applicable to lots of people. Uh, this one, I just, I mangled my first attempts, or at least I thought I did. Um, and so it was late at night and I had typed a bunch of stuff and I thought I was on a roll. And then I started rethinking some of it. I had misused a little terminology. I also read a different reply in the thread that really made me start second guessing my comments. Um, but it was, like I said, it was very late. I was tired. And rather than try to keep beating a dead horse and digging a deeper hole, I just deleted everything that I wrote. And then I thought, you know, I probably didn't need to delete everything, but I suppose better safe than sorry. So now that I've had a little bit of sleep, I've, I've decided to put this video uh, up so that I can try to tell the story that I was attempting to tell the first time. Um, and hopefully it will help somebody, maybe, I don't know, um, but mostly I just do this to keep myself entertained. Anyway, the story in the thread was uh, about the annoyance of the square root function, or rather how sometimes, you know, we throw around a square root and get two numbers returned, one positive, one negative, and other times we don't, right? And the fundamental difference between this situation is whether you're just thinking about general numerical relationships or getting more technical into the language and usage of functions, which are a little bit more tightly controlled. So if you and your friends are sitting around and uh, for whatever reason, you decide you need answers to x squared equals 16, you know, you might decide, well, x could be negative four or four because you're looking just at a general relationship. What numbers can get squared to give you 16? There's two of them, right? Um, and in some cases, especially when you're solving for numerical values that satisfy a particular relationship that might have squares in it, um, you might say, what, you know, I need the square root of 64. So I'm looking for numbers that can be squared to make 64. And hey, uh, you know, Maybe it's minus eight, maybe it's eight. It could be both. There's a lot of times where we have that plus minus uh, tag to square root values just because we're thinking more generally about just collecting up numbers that can give the result that we're looking for, okay? Now, the other way to tackle these things is to be a little bit more precise about the tools that you're using. And so now we, we step off of the street corner and we move into the federal court building uh, where we practice the mathematical court of law. And if we try to solve x squared equals 16, what we want to do in a technical sense is apply a function to both sides of the equation. Uh, the goal is to apply the function to the left, which will just return x by itself. So what we're looking for is what's called the inverse function of x squared. Okay, so we apply that function to the left side so that x squared just turns into x, and we then also have to apply that function or that inverse function to the right-hand side. So generally speaking, we know that the inverse of x squared is x and vice versa, okay? But the thing here is that since we are technically using functions, you can't have ambiguity in results of inverse functions. Um, just like functions themselves uh, have to pass the vertical line test, meaning if you go look at a particular x value, there can, there can only be one y value that gets assigned to it through the function. Inverse functions have to work the other way, but with no ambiguity, meaning um, we can only provide one result uh, from this operation. So if we pick up with x squared equals 16, we apply the square root function to both sides. Technically, we are using the square root now as an inverse function, not just a loose rule that says, give me some numbers that produce this result, uh, which means only one thing can result from this expression. And so we, we provide in return the positive root of 16. 
Okay, so in some cases, x squared equals 16 can lead to two answers. Uh, in other cases, it can lead to one, depending on how you're solving it. So where does that other thing go? So that's what this story is about. Um, so like I said, this x squared equals 16, if you're just talking about it loosely, you can come up with two numbers that square to be 16. Um, if you solve it more explicitly by going through a step-by-step -step algebraic process where you reach into your bucket of inverse functions and employ that inverse function, well, now you're more restricted because now you can only provide one result. Uh, if you turn this equation around a little bit and look at it from the square root side, um, square root of x equals four would only have one solution um, because we would square both sides uh, to get to x equals uh, 16, right? Um, technically, when you apply the square function to both sides of this, again, you are exploiting inverse functions. And so you can't have any ambiguity and so could you ever ask what's, you know, the square root of what gives negative four? Well, in a very loose general relationship sense, you know, we know that the square root of 16 sometimes is reported as plus or minus four, right? But in a technical sense, we shouldn't be able to solve this if we're using inverse functions, or maybe we can. Mm -hmm kind of okay so i'm going to tell you the story about the this part of it we can kind of solve that solve that maybe if we go back and reinvent what it is that we're talking about okay so i'm going to pull up some pictures here so if we have the equation y equals square root of x or the function y equals square root of x we square both sides that becomes x equals y squared now forget the technicalities if we just threw out x equals y squared in a vacuum and ask for a plot, it's a sideways parabola that looks like this, right? And so we go to 16 and which y value is associated to 16? Well, in this relationship, just generally, uh, there's two of them, but, and so just generally, informally speaking again, you know, sometimes you're gonna report square root of 16 as plus or minus four. But when we're being more technical, we only want to associate one input with one output because we can't have confusion when we're dealing with inverse functions. Now, people don't like to use negative numbers, I guess, uh, unless, <laughs> unless there's a reason not to. So historically, we've agreed that this becomes the piece of this graph that we are going to retain uh, in order to start tying together this square root relationship. And if you think about the graph of y equals square root of x, you only see this upper branch. You never see the lower branch, right? However, y equals square root of x numerically is kind of the same thing as x equals y squared, which does involve both branches. But with technical inverse function lingo, we can only keep the upper part so that there's unique associations back and forth. And so if we throw out the lower half of that curve x equals y squared uh, to present y equals square root of x, then the square root of 16 is four, that's it, end of story, right? This is when we're dealing more particularly again with functions, inverse functions. But there still was that lower half of that curve, right? So I'm going to invent the Ken the Metal Professor function. And I'm gonna write it almost like the square root, except I'm gonna put the square root sign backwards. This is a brand new function. This is my function, right? And this function is going to associate this relationship to the bottom half of that y equals x squared parabola, right? And in this case, the the special root of 16 would be reported as minus four because the associations would be coming from this set of unique associations from the lower half of that sideways parabola, right? So the square root of 16 is four. The mirror universe square root of 16, my invention, 
could be negative four. This function is just as good as the regular square root, okay? So maybe instead of the entire globe deciding that this is the version of the square root function we're gonna go with right here, we decide that in the Northern hemisphere, we're gonna start using this one. And in the Southern hemisphere, they'll start using this one. That'd be fine. And the end of that story would be that, you know, y equals square root of x would have this graph. This is now an invertible function because it's one to one. There's one input for every one output and vice versa. Uh, so the function square root of x equals four would be solvable because like when x is 16, the square root of 16 would be a uniquely assigned to four. The square root of x equals negative four. Well, that's not gonna have a solution because we can't go out to x equals 16 and go locate uh, an output of negative four, right? It's not there anymore because we've restricted uh, this particular function so that it's invertible. On the other hand, in the Southern Hemisphere now, if we're using this backwards root version of our function, uh, the equation backwards root of x equals four has no solution because when we go to x equals 16, there is no association with positive four. The only association is with negative four. So this equation would be the solvable one with this backwards weirdo version of the square root, okay? So all of that being said, I mean, the main point is that with square roots, it's all about context, right? If somebody says solve x squared equals 60, yeah, nobody's gonna throw you in jail if you say this is negative four and four. Uh, but if you are employing a more strict algebraic approach to solving this by doing a step-by-step -step operation on the equation to isolate x and return a value. Now you've put yourself in the more particular zone where you, can, you must have no ambiguity in the outputs. And so historically, we've agreed that this square root function will only return the positive answers. And so that's why sometimes people are particular about only allowing positive returns Whereas in other settings, all right, we'll throw out both of the potential numerical results and call it a day. And now I'm going to call it a day. And hopefully this made a little more sense than my original attempts at this conversation online.